Hi, welcome to another endorsement interview with the Times Editorial Board. Today we have uh, State Representative Mara Candelaria Reardon, who is the incumbent in uh, District 12. Thank you for coming. Thank I'm you. Doug Ross, editorial page editor at the Times. Uh, here with us also in the room is Bob Heiss, editor, and we also have uh, Brian Vernellis, our videographer, on the other side of the lens as always. Um, well, first of all, Mara, thank you for coming. And, uh, thank you let's, for having me. Sure. Let's start with a little bit of uh, who you are and, and what uh, um, brought you to this point where you went to run again. Well, um, I have uh, represented the 12th House District since 2006. I believe that we have uh, had, it, had an, a unique opportunity in Northwest Indiana, and I feel like the reason I'm seeking re-election is I don't believe that, that I'm finished being impactful in my community. I think it's something that is the initial reason that I chose to run, and I feel like we're on the cusp, especially with the South Shore train expansion just looming in the future, so I'm very excited about that. Okay, I'm glad you brought up the South Shore expansion. How do you see the funding working for it? Well, I think it's it's uh, been really, really um, useful to have the congressman and the RDA and all the other communities working collaboratively and not realizing that this train expansion is going to be have regional impact. I think that it's going to be a combination of state, federal, and local funds as we move forward. That's the only way that it's going to happen. As you know, we're often told in Northwest Indiana by the state powers that be that we don't have enough skin in the game. And I think this is an opportunity to show that we are all invested and we are all moving forward as a region. Okay. Um, well, not exactly every community is invested. How do you get past that? I think that we need to move forward with the, with the communities that are invested and the others will follow when they see the benefits to, the, to their communities. I don't think it's, it's something that's insurmountable. I think that while I admire uh, people that advocate for their local interests, I, I believe that this is not a time to be parochial. This is a time for us to come together and realize that it benefits the whole region. You have somebody like Karen Freeman Wilson who understands that an investment in Munster will benefit her community because it will certainly, it, it will, it's an investment in the entire line and, and moving the entire line forward. Right, okay. Um, let's talk about uh, jobs. I mean, obviously that's the one thing that's on everybody's mind. I'm sure they're saying that when you knock on doors. Um, so what do you do? Well, I think it's not the role of government to actually create jobs, but I think our role is much more to create a climate in which private investment can occur and bring those jobs to our community. In particular, I think that we've created a, a very good tax climate uh, is we, we have to also protect the resources that do impact our community positively, like the common construction wage is a big, is a big issue that I believe will be on the forefront. And that I believe will changing that or, or doing away with the common construction wage, I believe will have negative impacts. It, when people make more money, first of all, it's surety in business. People will, that come here know what they what to expect, people that do business here. So it's surety in business. It also protects communities. When people make higher wages, they spend more money, we increase our tax base, and we pay less for social services. So those are, those are some of the things. I also um, co-authored uh, House Bill 1198, which was um, a streamlining of the process of pe the way people do business in Indiana and streamline the process in the Secretary of State's office and located in the Secretary of State's office to move that forward. So those are some of the things that we can continue to do and some of the things that uh, I have done. Okay. Uh, the RDA is up for reauthorization. What do you think? I think we have a good sell. We have a good product to sell. For every one dollar that's spent, I mean that's spent of state money, we're able to leverage five more. 
I don't think there's any program, if you look at all the economic development incentives in this state, and we're doing that now, there's a study currently happening to uh, look at those incentives and, 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 and um, test their e efficacy. I think that you'll see that not one of them returns the amount of, of, of investment that the RDA does. And that's a big selling point, and I also believe that that the collaborative environment that is created is super important for us as we move forward. Okay, and meaning that we're all collaborative. Right, here, the so communities we... are collaborating. They're coming together. You can't say that. You can't say that not everybody. You know, the communities that have benefited are communities that that have not historically worked in the past together necessarily. And I think it's it's it's. I would like to see the economic development incentives long term run all the way all through run through the RDA. Then you wouldn't have competing jurisdictions trying to lure businesses. We've got enough competition from other states. We don't need competition among municipalities. I would love to see that long term vision of the RDA running the economic development programs for the state. Okay. Um, infrastructure, you know, in dot saying that the we're falling farther and farther behind and maintaining existing roads, um, how do you come up with the extra money? We have a two billion dollar surplus. We have extra money. The government is not about being a for-profit business. If you're building a surplus on the backs of Hoosiers, then what good is the surplus? We're not adequately funding our public schools. We're not spending money to uh, uh, protect our infrastructure and instead we're letting it crumble those are things that can be done I'm not saying that I believe we should spend down the entire surplus but that's not the role of government to save money on the backs of taxpayers that pay that money for those services okay uh, I'm glad you uh, uh, mentioned public schools and, and the whole funding issue one of the things we're seeing is um, the Center for uh, education and Career Innovation, CC, everybody knows it as, um, it was created after the budget was, was drafted, uh, you'll recall that. Uh, and so the question is, you know, do you leave it in going forward or do you, you know, do something that, that tries to uh, bring the board, uh, State Board of Education and, and Superintendent of Public Instruction closer together? I think that it? I think that abolishing that agency and a duplicative agency that was created for the sole purpose of circumventing a public elected official that was elected by over a million people in a larger margin by the gut than the governor I think it's wrong for we need to repeal it that's the way that's we have a Department of Education and we also have you know an effort moving forward with regional work councils that are that are appropriate for all kinds of uh, technical education I don't believe it's an agency we need I believe it was created with the for the sole purpose of circumventing a, a duly elected public official and I think that in order to bring harmony you need to realize that there there was a mistake made and that was a big mistake and I think that you're seeing in the Republican agenda a larger focus on as they announced this week a larger focus on public education that they've been attacking and and teachers and traditional public schools let's say okay at the expense of you know now, now you have some background in education so um, what kind of education reform would you want to do going forward well, I think we, we really have to start with what works. I think, first of all, um, it's really important that we talk about class size, uh, genuinely free textbooks, less, less emphasis on standardized testing. Those are things that, that and, and pre-K. The governor turned down $80 million from the federal government for pre-K. For pre Why? Because he doesn't want to be beholden to the federal government? We're already beholden to the federal government when we owe them till 2016 and for the unemployment trust fund. We already are beholden for the government for our road funds, our federal highway funds. So, so now children in Indiana don't get to go to pre-K because we don't want to be beholden to the federal government. We have to work together, no matter who the president is. I think one of the, one of the things that I've learned uh, the most 
it, from the General Assembly is, uh, and I've enjoyed is, is being able to work with those sides. That's what I, I've worked, I've been able to be successful in the majority and in the minority. So I've had both, I've, under, I've experienced both of those things and uh, I don't think it, it's very helpful to vilify anybody just because of political reasons. Okay. Um, the gambling, you know, whole casino gambling uh, uh, issue is going to come up with, you know, the potential for a land-based casino. Mm -hmm. What do you think of all that? I think the failings of the Gary Casino enterprise have been failings for lack of investment and lack of vision. There was uh, an investment that was made by East Chicago to access Klein Avenue and they made that investment in a ramp. That investment was never made at Buffington Harbor. The structures have not been maintained. It's not, if you're going to go land-based, I think it's only fair for people that have made those investments to have them rebuild in the footprint. That's the most that I would support, rebuilding in that footprint. Okay. And smoke-free footprint, I might add. <laughs> That's interesting uh, that you say smoke free. I uh, walked through the uh, uh, one of the casinos uh, floors and yeah. it was quite a bit of smoke. It's oh, it's horrible. Yeah, I so, mean that's a battle we lost, but we took a small, you know, we took a significant bite of the apple with the um, restaurants and bars. And uh, I was a co-author of the smoking ban with Charlie, my colleague. Charlie and, Brown. Uh, yes, and so. Um, we, we're going to continue to work at it. We're going because I believe the casino workers also deserve a smoke-free workplace. Okay, um, Bob, do you have questions? Yeah. Well, one of the things I've been asking, and it comes up when in the community and some and sometimes in these discussions, is is the region getting its fair share from Indianapolis? And there's there's people who don't think that, but then I wonder what your perspective is being with both sides and working with both sides. Feel like we get uh, the fair share. That's a tough question because I don't want to be ungrateful for the shares that we get. I think that when we needed, you know, I worked very, very hard to get $14 million included in the budget for the Little Calumet River Basin Commission to be able to finish their work on the levy. And so there's, there's that mindset, but I think that there, it's very difficult because it's it's a region as opposed, it's very difficult to measure always because it's a region as opposed to a municipality. Indianapolis gets a lot. We don't get the, you know, for the stadium or the racetrack or those, those big ticket projects. We wanted to use sales tax increment financing, which they used for Lucas, for, um, to capture that sales tax. We wanted to use that for the Cabela's development and were turned down. So. We have to continue to, we have to continue to be strong advocates for Northwest Indiana. It is challenging at times. I think that we're all we're had we're um, held to a different standard at times, and uh, we just have to continue to um, work at changing that mindset and changing the stigma of coming from the region. Do I remember correctly that that stadium is the only time a sales tax increment financing was used in, yes. in the whole state? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the easy question is, what's the difference, primary difference between you and your uh, opponent? Well, um, I would say a clear understanding of the legislative process and experience. Like I said, I, I've worked with, I've worked in the minority. I've navigated the minority and the majority. Um, this isn't something that I woke up after having a 30-year career and saying, hey, I think I'll be a legislator. I've dedicated my life to public service. It's what I want to do with my life, to try to be impactful in my community. It's the example that my parents always gave me. It's certainly no get-rich-quick scheme, but I'm a full-time legislator. This is what I do, and uh, if you do it right, it is a full-time job. Okay. Um, what did we not ask that we should have asked? Hmm. Well, I think uh, just my number one budget priority right now, and the thing I'm hearing the most is not about jobs, but the thing I'm hearing the most about is public education. 
it absolutely is the number one budget priority that that we have this legislative session and it's very it's very encouraging me it's very encouraging to me that the Republicans have finally embraced the mantra of public education. Now, I hope it translates into more than a press conference and a few mailers because their record is not good on public education. We talked about, we talk about the one, they talk about the 1% increase that was given last biennium. And that 1% increase was on the decreased baseline of 300 million that was taken out in the previous budget and never returned. So it's a decreased budget, and, and you cannot shrink the pie and then continue to invite more people in the form of vouchers and charter schools to have a piece of that pie without traditional public schools suffering. I've got schools in Munster and Griffith and Highland that would have loved some loan forgiveness to the tune of $91 million that we gave to charter schools. You can't do it at the expense of traditional public education. We are held, we, the public schools are held to a different standard, and that's not right. We have to, we have to be, level the playing field and make a more equitable distribution of those funds. If they're truly public schools, charter public charters, then they need to be held to the same standards. Okay. Um, well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Thank you for viewing.